again, they're so focused on their hatred, they didn't take any action against it. We're too busy complaining. We're too busy, like as a, like, and it goes across generation. I know they say millennials complain too much, and I think it's like every generation across the board, everybody complains. But rather than just like picking up something, doing something, and it might be not, it, be, it might be naive of me to just say, do something, do anything, you know, go to your neighbors, do like anything besides saying he's not prime president or Ilhan is that or anything like that. It's like hatred has existed as long as humans have so caring loving action things just do something <coughs> finally i'd love to know how to answer that question i really wish more people would ask blank what's that question and what would your answer be jaylani let me start with you how am i feeling how are you feeling um i feel we are in a time where we are not talking to each other we are so polarized in this nation. Uh, we have uh, we have MSNBC and Fox News audiences um, who are not patient enough to empathetically listen to each other. Um, if we listen to our feelings, um, our needs and wants, uh, I think we realize that we can solve a lot of these problems that politicians have used to divide us. And so, for people who are listening today, I encourage you to come on down to our wonderful state. It's, um, this is a beautiful state that has. Uh, a vibrant community, probably the best food you can find in the country, probably uh, some of the best uh, people, and uh, you're going to see a very visible Muslim population, and, and uh, say hello, and we'll have a conversation. Mohammed, I really wish more people would ask me. All I want them to know is to ask me that we are another family. It will give them full information they want to, and it will give them comfortability to understand that we are part of the neighborhood. Nadia, I really wish more people would ask me why are you running at the height of all this hatred? All this, like, Ilhan Omar, um, Trump, why are you running? And your answer would be? Because I'm awesome. <laughs> 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 Duh. Because I can, it's my American right? But, um, no, because I think it's now more than ever I Alima, I really wish more people would ask me. To listen to their stories. I think right now the times that we're living in, we need to listen to each other. And stories are vital so, so that we can work on what makes people think the way they do, they do and challenge our biases. That was Halima Ahmed, a student at Hamlin University. We also heard from Jailani Hussein, Executive Director for CARE Minnesota, Mohammed Issa Bare with Hennepin County, Nadia Mohammed, a candidate for St. Louis Park City Council. St. Louis Park is a neighborhood in Minneapolis. Haji Youssef, the host of the Haji Live podcast, and Uba Jama, a public school teacher. Mukhtar Ibrahim was there with us last week, and he joins us next to talk about Sahan Journal and why he felt that Minnesota needed a news source for and about immigrants. Stay close. Thanks for making WLRN part of your morning. Keep listening to 1A, and at 11 a.m. we have On Point. This is Oli Vargas. The time is 10.38. WLRN reaches educated professionals and business owners in South Florida. WLRN's audience can be yours as well. If your company would like to reach our audience and support independent journalism in the community, email us at underwriting at friends of WLRN.org. Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders cares for children with rare childhood cancers and those with even the most common blood disorders. When it matters most for your child, you can trust the board-certified, fellowship-trained hematologists and oncologists at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital to provide comprehensive patient and family-centered care. Learn more at gdch.com slash cancer. I'm Magna Chakravarti, coming up on the next Up Point, a conversation with best-selling writer Walter Mosley, which is hard-boiled character Easy Rollins and his life in crime writing. Mosley is now sharing the secrets of the trade and writing tips with a new generation. That's coming up on the next Up Point from NPR. Coming up at 11 on 91.3. <coughs> <coughs> for NPR comes from this station and from Atlassian, a collaboration software company powering teams around the world, committed to providing the tools and practices to help teams plan, track, build, and work better together.
Oscar's sister said, I will have FPL debit bill from Carla's account since we are past due. Would you like to reply? Yes. What do you want to say? That is fine, period. But the unit has no air conditioning, period. That is not good, period. Your message says that is fine, but the unit has no air conditioning. That is not good. Ready to send it? Yes. Okay, it's sent. Have you wavered since? Tell us your story. 855-236-1A1A Or send us an audio file with our app 1A Vox Pop. We'll share some of your stories soon on 1A. We've been listening to highlights of a conversation we had last week with Somali Americans in Minneapolis. It's part of our project 1A Across America, taking us to places that tend to get ignored in election years. Something we talked about a lot was feeling welcome in the Twin Cities and in the U.S. at this particular political moment. A few of you shared messages of welcome to Somali immigrants like this one that landed in our inbox. Hello, my name is Eli Wallensee from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I live in the Whittier neighborhood, which has a large Somalian population. <laughs> However, I am not Somalian myself, uh, Caucasian. And I was calling to point out uh, what a wonderful community Whittier is with all of our diversity. But also, uh, not a, wasn't a very good community up until about 2002. And what really changed the tide of crime was seeing a, a group like the Somalian immigrants move into our community with family values uh, and, 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 and low drug use and alcohol use and all those wonderful things that come along with, with uh, building a good community. So we're, we uh, very much welcome the immigrant community and very much welcome the Somalian community. Eli, thanks for sharing your thoughts and we welcome more of your questions and thoughts and reactions to anything we heard from our conversation last week in Minneapolis. <coughs> Email us 1A at WAMU.org, tweet us at 1A or comment on our Facebook page. As we mentioned, Mukhtar Ibrahim was with us last week. He's the editor and executive director of Sahan Journal, a new nonprofit news magazine that's focused on immigrant stories. We partnered with Sahan for this conversation, and he joins us now from one of our Across America partner stations, Minnesota Public Radio. Mukhtar, welcome to the program. Hi, Joshua. Thank you for having me. Any general reactions to what we heard from our conversation? Um, well, I think that was really um, a very nuanced, uh, amazing conversation about um, Somali life in Minnesota and in Naples in general. I thought people were really frank with, um, you know, sharing their experiences of living in Minnesota and uh, what it means to be a Somali in, um, in 2019. That kind of frankness and nuance, I presume, is one of the reasons why you launched Sahan Journal this summer. Tell us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we launched uh, Sahan Journal uh, a couple of weeks ago. It went live uh, so people can uh, read our stories. But the, the main idea we uh, launched this uh, project is to really highlight stories about uh, immigrants and refugees in Minnesota. Uh, at the time when, uh, you know, immigrants and refugees are targets of hateful rhetoric in uh, politics and uh, some uh, media, we felt like we need more accurate and nuanced stories that uh, present the reality of what it means to be an, Im an immigrant and refugee in Minnesota. So the goal is to uh, really tell authentic stories about uh, these communities, uh, highlight their successes, challenges, and uh, how they are transforming the state. Speaking of the transformation, Eli kind of mentioned that in terms of how Somali immigrants revitalized his neighborhood. What's your sense of how Somalis have affected the Twin Cities? Right. Um, I came uh, to this country, to Minnesota, in 2005 when, um, you know, the community was coming in. Uh, at that time, a lot of people were coming in in 2005, 6, 7. Um, and, and since that, uh, since, you know, those years, we have uh, seen a lot of uh, momentum in how people are trying to um, participate in the democratic process, uh, raise their families, a lot of... Uh, you know, students are graduating from colleges and they're going into the workforce. Um, there's a large representation of um, Somalis in, in Minnesota and its politics. We have um, a city council member on this Minneapolis city council, uh, two uh, local lawmakers in the uh, state legislature. In hand is representing a large district in um, Minneapolis.
examples and it's about so um, I think things have been really changing for the better for the community since you know the last couple of years. Why did so many Somalis settle in the Twin Cities? We've gotten a number of listeners who've asked about why that region was kind of an epicenter, particularly questions like what Patricia asked. She wants to know why, oh why, did they settle in Minnesota, one of the coldest places in the country? Always been curious about this. Yeah, a lot of people are really curious about that. People coming from a warm climate to one of the coldest pl uh, places in, in the U.S. Uh, but, you know, Minnesota was um, a place that has always been a welcoming to refugees and, and immigrants. Um, we have a large vibrant communities from all, all across the world. Uh, the Hmong population is a large Liberian population is here, a large East African. But I think when people, when Somalis were coming in late 1990s and early 2000s, um, there were, you know, a low employment rate in Minnesota and people who came here um, at that period um, uh, kind of <coughs> sponsored up their families back home and when people were settling, even if they uh, were placed in a place that had small Somali communities, they will migrate to Minnesota so that they can be uh, at the place where there is uh, some kind of growing community. So that kind of migration and also the welcoming atmosphere in Minnesota and the um, social services were also very generous to um, refugees who had uh, no means, you know, they could not uh, get help, so the social services were very helpful when people come in so that they can sustain uh, their lives and, and grow to be a uh, contributing society as we are seeing right now. Uh, so all those combined, I think, attracted, um, you know, refugees, especially Somalis, to come to Minnesota. One of the things that came up a number of times during our conversation was that there were some people, some speakers and preachers and evangelists and such, who were coming to rural parts of Minnesota. Here is a clip of how Haji Yusuf described it. And then you have hateful preachers that are coming from places like in California and many other places that go to these rural towns in, in, in Minnesota and start talking about this hate, this untruth about Islam, uh, about Sharia law, about um, uh, uh, you know, bringing diseases and not wanting this community to be <coughs> All of a sudden people are like, okay, you know, identifying this recently arriving immigrant group as, as the enemy. Mukhtar Ibrahim, can you describe that a little more? You followed this story that Haji is talking about. What was going on? Yeah, so um, we, we have been seeing um, anti-Islamic speakers frequently visiting uh, rural towns in Minnesota and preaching about how uh, Muslims are going to take over, you know, Minnesota and afraid about, you know, jihad and, and Sharia and all that. Um, and, and, you know, these rural towns are becoming um, a fertile ground for those kind of speakers who, are, uh, who made their career by reaching this kind of rhetoric around Islam and Jihad. And um, I think uh, we are seeing the consequences of that. I think uh, Jilani kind of mentioned it. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, two, three years ago, we, uh, a mosque in uh, Bloomington, which is uh, you know, next to Minneapolis, um, was firebombed and, and the people who carried that attack was um, some group three uh, men from uh, Illinois. So, so they drove all the way from uh, the state to come to this uh, mosque to uh, target them. And, and I think, you know, all this rhetoric around uh, Somalis and uh, Muslims in Minnesota and how they are, even they preach, you know, um, like these people are uh, buying gas stations and working at airports to kind of pave way for violent takeover. That's, that, those are some of the rhetorics we are hearing from this anti-Islamic speaker. So, um, yeah, it, it's a reality that we're seeing. How are you seeing that kind of rhetoric play into local politics, either you know, the 2016 election, the upcoming election next year, the impact of Somali Americans showing up at the polls? Does that spill over into politics? Uh, somewhat. I think the Twin Cities and the Metro uh, is uh, generally uh, a very welcoming space, but when you go outside, you know, the metro area and go to Paul and Greater Minnesota, that's where things have been changing. Um, that's where I think Trump got most of his votes. Um, but, you know, I think that also inspires and it encourages more people to participate in, in elections and in Minneapolis uh, where there's a large Somali population, um, Somalis in, in that uh, neighborhood, Sea Riverside, are the ones that 
really come out when you look at the numbers, the election data. The numbers are just way above any other neighborhood in Minneapolis. Um, so people are really trying to um, see how their votes can change lives and they just want to be part of this um, uh, momentum where people want to participate in, in, in the uh, democratic process. And just to be clear, we talked about the Twin Cities having a large Somali population. How large are we talking about? I mean, by one estimate, the total estimated Somali American population is about 135,000 people. How many are in the Twin Cities, roughly? Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on who you ask. <laughs> but um, the, the data which was compiled by APM Research Lab, which is a sister organization to um, Minnesota Public Radio, says there are about 75,000 Somalis in Minnesota. And that's roughly 1.3% um, of the total population of, of Minnesota. So, um, and the majority of those people came between, you know, uh, early 2000 and uh, around 2015. And when, you know, this new administration came in, we have seen a huge decline in the number of refugees uh, coming to Minnesota. In 2018, for example, only 48 people uh, came from Somalia. And that number was about close to 1,000 in the previous years, 2015-16. Glad to get some of your experiences about being a Somali American, some of your stories. Deca writes, since I was the first person in my family born in the U.S., I lost a lot of the Somali language I was taught as a child. Now I feel lost between two worlds. One where I'm more American, socially and in school, and one where I'm more Somali when I'm with family. I'm Joshua Johnson, and you're listening to 1A. Let me ask you a little bit more about politics. Of course, Congressman Ilhan Omar is a big topic of conversation nationally. It wasn't the focus of our conversation in Minneapolis, but both the President and Congressman Omar did come up. People had mixed things to say uh, in regards to the Congresswoman, and, and here's a little bit of what they said. We are in a very unique time in history where I believe the concept of what America and Americans are is being questioned by this president who continues to pray and actually welcome hate into the White House and legislate with <coughs> Islamophobia and xenophobia and anti-Semitism. Uh, and I, I, I argue that what's happening to Ilhan is what's happening to Muslims across this country. <laughs> she is not <coughs> <coughs> you know what she's doing. I did, I completely, as as a person, I completely disagree with her. What she is doing is not really helping the community. It's bringing more enemies, more problems, more complications, and she needs to really go back to the drawing board. Those were Jelani Hussein, the executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, Minnesota, followed by Mohammed Bare, who is an employee of Hennepin County, Minneapolis, is the county seat of Hennepin County. What is your sense, Mukhtar, of Ilhan Omar's popularity, her reelectability? One of our listeners, Hanolato, tweeted, is Ilhan going to be reelected? What's your sense of her standing in the community? You know, as you heard between those two speakers, um, there's diverse opinions about um, Ilhan in the community. And um, when you think about the Somali community, it's not really a, a monolithic community that has one, one voice, one uh, way of thinking. And, you know, Ilhan is um, someone who I think is very popular in, in the community and the district that she represents a lot of uh, young people, especially uh, Muslims, young Muslims uh, who wear the hijab, uh, view her as a role model. And um, I think she, she is someone who, you know, is, I think her election was a test, you know, for the country in, in a simpler way and a test for I think also more for, for the media and how it approaches, you know, covering in hand as a politician who is the first of many things, first, you know, Muslim, uh, who wears the hijab, first um, person who uh, came from a Fiji camp and many things. Um, so it, it puts on um, the spotlight on the, uh, you know, the level of uh, how, how media usually covers, you know, politicians are straightforward. But when it comes to Ilhan, you see all these uh, perceptions that people are bring to their stories, and uh, it, it, I think, kind of clouds how, you know, giving a good information about who she is as a person. Speaking of the media, before I have to let you go, I wonder where you would like to see the media narrative on a national level go as it relates to talking about Somali-Americans. 
we try to kind of create this unique space for Somali Americans to speak for themselves, gotten an array of different responses, some of which have been more polite than others, I'm sad to say. But I wonder broadly, before we let you go, Mukhtar, what you would like to see change in the national narrative around Somali Americans. I think I hope people will see this community as any other community that um, has come to America. Uh, of course, you know, we um, Somalis I mean, sort of face their own challenges. Uh, we have our own uh, way of uh, thinking and a way of, uh, you know, dressing and, and, and uh, praying. But we are, at the end of the day, you know, any other uh, immigrant group that has come here before. And we, we are here, we are we're staying in Minnesota, as the uh, woman on the show said. Um, and people are raising their families and, and becoming, uh, uh, making Minnesota a future place uh, to live and uh, making a better, uh, better place to uh, raise families and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, basically, you know, we, we just want people to see us as any other uh, immigrant group in Minnesota. Mukhtar Ibrahim is the editor and executive director of Sahan Journal. You can find its reporting online at S-A-H-A-N journal.org. Mukhtar, thanks for talking to us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This conversation was produced by Amanda Williams, with special thanks to Mukhtar and Sahan Journal and the Minnesota Public Radio team that helped us with our visit. To learn more about Across America and to watch our conversation in Minneapolis, go to the 1a.org slash Across America. 1A Across America is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you tomorrow for the Friday News Roundup. This is 1A. Major funding for On Point is provided by GEICO, offering car insurance as well as services for homeowners and renters insurance through the GEICO Insurance Agency. Additional information can be found at geico.com or 1-800-947-AUTO. From NPR and WBUR Boston, I'm Magna Chakrabarty. This is On Point. Novelist Walter Mosley is best known for his beloved Easy Rollins series. Mysteries that paint a profound portrait of L.A.'s black community. Mosley says that in a great mystery, quote, the crime being investigated reveals a deeper But how does the great novelist put that story on the page? Mosley's latest book 
is elements of fiction, and in it, he explores the alchemy that makes for writing that transcends convention, that pulls fully realized lives and entire worlds from the spirit of the love of the Up next on point, the craft of great writing with Walter Mosley. First the news. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corporal Kennedy. The hurricane says the hurricane door remains a powerful storm with top steam winds of 110 miles per hour. The hurricane eyewall is now centered barely 50 miles off Charleston, South Carolina, where NPR's Bobby Allen is. Here in Charleston, South Carolina, ferocious winds are taking down tree limbs everywhere I look. It's knocking out power. Out-of-order traffic signals are swaying back and forth on top of streets that are just completely inundated with extensive flooding. And it's causing rescuers to push vehicles stuck in these giant pools of water to safety. And here is Bobby Allen in Charleston, South Carolina. The hurricane is expected to continue crawling north along the east coast. Hurricane warnings are posted up to the southern Virginia border. As Dorian makes his way up the East Coast, President Trump continues to insist Alabama was originally forecast to be hit by the storm. And PR's Aisha Roscoe reports that Trump has lashed out at the media for saying he was incorrect about the path of the hurricane over the weekend. The National Hurricane Service did say late last week that Alabama might be hit by Trump's force wind. But when Trump began tweeting about the state on Sunday, federal forecasters were predicting that Alabama would not see any effects from the storm. Trump has continued to stand by his false claims, tweeting about his Peter. He displayed a map on Wednesday with the storm's path offered by a marker to extend to Alabama. Trump canceled a planned trip to Poland to help oversee the U.S. government's hurricane response. He also spoke with the Prime Minister of the Bahamas on Wednesday and pledged to help with the nation's recovery after its devastating blow from Dorian. I'm Sharasko, NPR News, Washington. United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson is conceding that the UK Parliament will be able to block him from crashing the country out of the European Union without a deal at the end of October. But as NPR's Frank Langford reports from London, what Johnson really wants is a general election. The Johnson's government has abandoned a plan to bog down the bill, blocking the noble Brexit in the House of Lords, the upper house of the British Parliament, acknowledging it will become law. Now, he's pressing hard for a general election next month hopes of rebuilding a majority in Parliament so he can finally execute Brexit more than three years after the country's landmark referendum. So far, the opposition Labour Party has rejected Johnson's call for an election, saying they don't trust the Prime Minister and want to be sure a no deal Brexit is off the table for now. The general election, though, seems almost a certainty this fall. The question is when. Frank Lankett, NPR News, London. On Wall Street, stocks are sharply up. The Dow Jones Industrials are up 429 points, or more than 1.5%, to 26,785. NASDAQ is also up more than 1.5%. This is NPR. From the WLRM studios of the Miami Herald, I'm Christine Matei. Governor Ron DeSantis is pledging support for the Bahamas after the onslaught of Hurricane Dorian on the island chain and says the state stands ready to help the Carolinas if needed. DeSantis says he's been assured by Florida's emergency management director that the state has plenty of supplies that could help the Bahamas as it deals with widespread devastation from the storm. We have hundreds of thousands of bottles of water uh, for this hurricane season that are going to expire uh, when, when, when the hurricane season ends. And so we're not out of the woods when the hurricane season obviously we're at the peak, but there's obviously a chance we don't have a storm and then that water would go to waste. So we're going to be moving some of that water to the Bahamas. Dorian struck the Bahamas over the weekend as a monster Category 5 hurricane. The storm, which is now a Category 3, has been hitting parts of the Carolinas with torrential rain and what the National Hurricane Center is calling life-threatening storm surge. While well, alcohol and inattentive captains are among the leading causes of recreational boating accidents, detailed in a Coast Guard report, the annual survey was released just days before nearly three dozen people were killed in a dive boat fire in California. While collisions and falling overboard cause more marine deaths than fires do, the vast majority of accidents are preventable. Anna Morris is being safe on the water starts with taking a page from the cruise line. She's an education officer with the Tampa Bay chapter of the Power Squadron at the Marine Safety Club. And she says whenever she and her husband take guests boating, they always begin with a talk about safety. You have to have the safety briefing so that people know how to respond. We take our gear to the where the fire extinguishers are. 
Florida led the nation in recreational boating accidents and deaths in 2018, with 57 deaths. This is WLRN News. I'm Christine DeMatte. You probably already know that you can listen to WLRN online anytime at WLRN.org or on your phone by downloading the WLRN mobile app. Well, now you can listen to us on your smart speaker as well. Just ask your smart speaker to play WLRN. Support for NPR comes from Warner Brothers with the new motion picture, The Goldfinch. A 13-year-old uses his mother to a bombing at an art museum, but takes with him a painting that becomes a singular source of hope. The Goldfinch in theaters September 13th. From NPR and WBUR Boston, I'm Magna Chakrabarty, and this is On Point. Beginning, middle, end. That is a story in its simplest terms. Writer Walter Mosley has published over 50 beginnings, middle, and ends in his storied career. He's best known for his mystery series featuring Easy Rawlings an African-American World War II veteran turned private eye. And Mosley's novels show us that between those beginnings, middles, and ends, there's some kind of magic that happens that okay. makes for great writing. But can that magic be wrestled down into craft? Well, in his latest book, Mosley takes on this question of how to create fiction that transcends. So this hour on point, a conversation with writer Walter Mosley. And you can join us. Has Walter Mosley's work impacted you as a reader? Do you have a favorite book or passage? And writers or aspiring writers, what questions do you have for the master of this craft, for one of the masters, Walter Mosley? We're at 1-800-423-8255. That's 800-423-TALK. You can also join us anytime at... I'm ever taken me to write a book for six weeks. Wow. There are two books, Gone Fishing and Killing Johnny Fry. Those two books, six weeks. Uh, the longest book it ever took me to write was uh, John Woman. <coughs> that took 18, 19 years to write that book. I just, you know, I'm, and you know, cause one of the big things about writing, I tell everybody, if you want to write, you write every day. If you wake up every morning and, and, and you write every morning, 365 days a year. It doesn't have to be that long, two, three hours, but it has to be every day. And uh, on that schedule, about six months uh, for most books that, that I'm working on. And so what are, do you, do you have a set uh, time of day that you do this? I do it the first thing I wake up in the morning. And what if, what if you hit with writer's block that morning? What do you do? Yeah, writer's block's an interesting thing because, you know, it sounds like one thing. <coughs> uh, but it could be many things. Writer's block could be like a deep, unconscious, you know, uh, damage that you actually can't get around because there's something that you don't know that's telling you you can't do this. A writer's block you know, might be that uh, you know, you're just nervous or, or you haven't had enough time to digest the data, uh, something like that. Well, you just start writing something else. You know, like, I can't write this right now, so I'm gonna put that aside and I'm gonna write this other thing. And you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, you have to discover what the block is. It doesn't mean you should just go to something else or you should go to a psychotherapist. <laughs> and it depends, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's like, sometimes it's a writer's block, that's one thing. No, it could be a hundred different reasons that you have writer's block. Well, we are talking this hour with Walter Mosley. He is the best of selling novel of the Easy Rollins series, among others. Others, I should say, he has a new book out about the craft of writing called Elements of Fiction. And we want to know what your question is to Walter Mosley. We're at 1 800 423 8255. It's 800 423 talk. We'll be back. It's an 
This coming season showcases the Miami point of view through its story, actors, and playwrights. Theater Up Close features a world from hit, New York Times critics pick, a world premiere, and more. Five show packages are available at our show. Support for On Point comes from Poster Smith, printing posters on wrinkle-resistant foldable fabric that transports flat for conference presentations. Poster Smith provides a service to research communities worldwide. Learn more at postersmith.com. And Noon, whose yellow, green, and red approach to categorizing food is designed to help people make improved meal choices with the goal of losing weight and keeping it off for good. Learn more at Noon, N-O-O-N.com. I'm Megan Chakrabarty. We're talking with master writer Walter Murphy. He is the author of more than 50 books, including the Easy Rolling Mystery Series, the best-selling series. That's just one of the many characters that have become a major part of American fiction. He has a new book out about writing fiction it's called Elements of Fiction, and it's an exploration of how great fiction is. You can find an excerpt of it at onpointradio.org. And we're at 1-800-423-8255. That's 800-423-TALK. Uh, and Walter Mosley, we've got a lot of comments coming in. Uh, for example, over Twitter here, Leslie Small says, I love the Easy Rolling in the book. Never having had the chance to meet them, they give me a chance into what, uh, a glance into what my grandfather's life as a black head and migrant from Mississippi to Chicago during that period would have been.
and you reread it, and you edit it, and you edit it. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. finished my first novel, and I'm by no means a perfectionist, but I'm curious what you have to say about when it's good enough. When do you stop editing, and when do you publish? <laughs> you know, I have like a, 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 an answer for that that I always give. You write the book, and then you read it, and say, oh, there's some mistakes, I'm going to fix them. And then you read it again, and say, oh, there's some more, some more mistakes, I'm going to fix them. And you do it again and again and again. Let's say you do it 25 times. You read the book, find mistakes, fix them. Read the book, find mistakes, fix them. On the 26th time you read the book, you find mistakes, and you realize you don't know how to fix them. That's when your book is finished. Huh. Fascinating. Stephen, thank you so much for your call. Uh, let's hop over to Miami, Florida, where Larry is calling from. Larry, you're on the air with Walter Mosley. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. So. Pleasure to uh, talk with you. I met you uh, several years ago in New York, and you did a, a book signing, and we were chatting, and uh, you mentioned that you were done with Easy Rollins, that there weren't, aren't, weren't going to be any more. And I see yeah. you coming back. I'm yeah, it's true. How that happened, <laughs> and uh, and also uh, the process. And, and I'm inspired. I'm a frustrated writer myself, but uh, you're inspiring me to do the hundred days and, and get something mm -hmm. out there. But how did you get your first one published? How did how did you find uh, a publisher or an agent and all of that? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the thing about Easy Rollins is I, I thought I had finished after Blonde Faith, but I realized uh, a couple of years later that the reason I'd stopped is because I was no longer going to be talking about my father's world and experience, but I was going to be talking about mine. And I hadn't understood that. Once once I got that, uh, I could write, write Little Green, and you know I could just keep on from there. I understood that. Uh, uh, it's interesting. The first book I, I wrote was Gone Fishing. I sent it out. Everybody said, oh, it's wonderful. It's good. It's this, it's that. But it's, it's not a commercial. I said, what does that mean? I said, well, you know, it's about two young black men coming of age in the deep south. You know, there's no uh, white people. There's no uh, black women. I mean, you know, white, white people don't read about black people. Black women don't like black men, and black men don't read, so we can't publish your book. Now, they were wrong about all that stuff, but still, I didn't publish my book. Then I wrote uh, uh, the, the next one, still with Easy Rollins and Mouse, uh, uh, you know, Devil in a Blue Dress. And uh, I, I sent it to an agent. She took it immediately. She sent it out to like seven publishers, and six of them wanted it. It was, you know, from from absolutely impossible to hey, we we want to do it. Wow. Well, so Walter Mosley, uh, there's something uh, that Larry asked. That I just want to follow up on uh, okay. a little bit, and um, you know, because he talked about his love for Easy Rollins as a character, and, and he was glad that you 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 started writing again. I'm wondering, do you ever reach a point with characters that become really beloved by by fans, where uh, as a writer, do you feel um, uh, obligated may not be the right word, but do you feel a pressure to sort of uh, have your character continue to conform to what might be fans' expectations, or uh, do you, does the story ever evolve in, in a way where a character ends up doing something that fans may not actually ever expect him, to, him or her to do, and, and you worry about their response? Like, who owns this character after all? Uh, I do. I mean, you, every reader owns the novel, because when you read a novel, it's your novel, it's no longer mine. I can't come in and say you're wrong about what you're thinking. Uh, but, uh, I, people want me to do things, and that's all good and well, but I don't do it unless I want to do it. And, that's, and I think that that's, you know, if, if, if a writer falls out of that you know, particular sphere, uh, they're going to be in trouble you know, because what you're doing is you're, you're not writing according to what comes up naturally every morning. You're writing according to what people are saying they want to see from you. Well, let's go to Chaz, who's calling from Coral Gables, Florida. Chaz, you're on the air. Oh, my God, I can't believe I'm talking to Walter Mosley. Mr. Mosley, I heard you on a podcast, The Literary Life. I'm a friend of Mitchell Kaplan's at a mile away from Books and Books. I ran out, I got John Woman, I read it, I loved it, and then I got, this year, you write your novel, sir, and I am three quarters of the way on, into my first novel. I've written plays and produced, but I, I read your books, and it gave me the impetus, and, and above all, the courage. So I want to thank you profusely, and I can't believe I'm talking to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we can get another caller in here. you got a lot of fans. No surprise there, Walter Mosley. Um, let's see if we can go to Gus, who's calling from Asheville, New York. Gus, is, Gus, you're on the air. Yes, Walter. 
Uh, I really enjoy a lot of your characters and have read many of your books. I did attend a, uh, a reading you did under the Brooklyn Bridge at a bookstore uh, some years back. But uh, one of my character, one of your characters, that's I think one of my favorite was a guy named a character named Socrates Fortlow. Uh, yeah. I think he was in a book called The Right Mistake, and I I'm not sure if he has appeared since, but. Uh, uh, he just is, I think he brings out, I think, one of the wonderful qualities uh, of fiction uh, that you do so well about, uh, you know, a fallen guy and uh, makes a terrible mess at a young age of his life and uh, comes back and, uh, and puts his nose to the grindstone and he fights his way back to a good life and a redeemed life. And, uh, I just wanted to express real appreciation for for your writing. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. There there hasn't been a book after uh, the book you read, but before but before it, I wrote two books: Always Outnumbered, Always Outgunned, which is also a movie with Lawrence Fishburne, and Walking the Dog. So, if you haven't seen those two, they're the earlier iterations. Well, we have about a minute left to go, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Rosley, and I just wanted to ask you uh, one last question about the dedication in your book, In Elements of Fiction. Mm -hmm. You dedicate it to uh, John Singleton, um, yeah. or the late John Singleton, I should say, and you call him one of the most original and creative individuals I have ever known. Can you tell us more about why he is uh, in the dedication of your book? Well, you know, I've been working with John for the last four years, a little bit more, uh, on the on, on the show Snowfall, the television show Snowfall, and uh, you know, as a writer and you know, as an advisor, and you know, John, you know, just just being around John, listening to John, you know, he, he's so, you know, he's so uh, quirky and nerdy and, and, and but uh, but brilliant and and so committed to the story that he wanted to tell. I mean, he was born in South Central, he lived in South Central, he worked there. Uh, you know, if you, if you went on the set, there's all these people in the crew saying, "Yeah, man, I just got out of prison. I went to John, and John said." Okay, you can come work with us. You know, he was—he just did everything. He's a, such a wonderful guy, and you know, Boys in the Hood is completely original. Mm -hmm. He made—he made new film with that one. Well, Walter Mosley, best-selling novelist of more than 50 books. His latest book is Elements of Fiction, and we have an excerpt of it at OnPointRadio.org. Mr. Mosley, it's been so wonderful to spend this past hour with you. Thank you so much. And thank you too, Megan. It was really enjoyable. I'm Megan Chakrabarty. This is On Point. On Point is a production of WBUR Boston and NPR. from the Museum of Science in Boston, providing pre-K through grade 12 engineering curricula, from We Engineer to Engineering the Future, with teacher guides, storybooks, kits, and videos, all designed to fuel dynamic STEM education. More at MOS.org. And Reddit and WBUR presenting Endless Thread, the podcast that brings stories discovered on Reddit to you each week. A wide range of tales told with intelligence and humor. Endless Thread, available on Apple Podcasts. This is 91.3 WLRN in HD1 Miami, Fort Lauderdale, 91.5 WKWM in HD1 Marathon Key West, 90.7 WFLP HD for West Palm Beach and 101.9 NPR for the Palm Beaches. You can go from couch to finish line with the Team Footworks Beginner Walking and Running Program Fitness 101. The seven-week program gradually prepares you to complete a 5K. Three pace groups.
bracing for the storm surge when you expect a vulnerable time. I call it the city officials say they expect another 10 inches of rain before the day of the night. That's in addition to an 8 to 9 foot storm surge at high tide. Nearly 100 roads in and around the city are closed. Thousands are without electricity. But one of the biggest problems is toppling trees. Here's the director of emergency management, Shana Scaff. Hey, um, you know, I'm hearing lots of trees down, trees on top of cars, trees blocking roadways. Authorities say they'll have to wait until the storm has passed, perhaps later tonight to assess the damage, and then clean up begins tomorrow. For NPR News, I'm Victoria Hansen in Charleston. The extent of the loss suffered in the Bahamas earlier this week is beginning to come into focus. At least 20 deaths are now attributed to Hurricane Dory. Chris Brown is a reporter for the Nassau Guardian. She spoke to NPR about families in mourning, including this account from one parent. I feel like this is five-year-old son. He put his son on the, the top of a roof of a home. And about a minute later, as he was trying to get up on that same roof, a storm surge knocked his son on the other side of the house into the murky water flu and he's never seen his son again since. She spent hours searching for his son. His leg was tearing by some degree, so he was bleeding. He also reported being shocked in the water. That's Crystal Brown, a reporter for the Nassau Guardian, speaking to NPR. Large portions of Abaco and Grand Bahama are in ruin. U.S. and Chinese negotiators plan to meet early in October for the next round of trade talks.